Well, hello everyone and welcome to Business Ever Breakfast. I'm Pam Tipton. I'm one of the directors of custom programs here uh, as part of the executive education team at uh, Gozueta Business School. And during the month of August, we are taking on a more individually focused set of topics and following up on last session on creating career option, today's topic is on creating financial flexibility and freedom. We intentionally paired these topics together as both give us options and options give us freedom of choice and most likely uh, a little more peace of mind too. <laughs> so no matter where you are in your life's journey, options are definitely power. Having options puts us in the driver's seat by really proactively providing us the right, if you will, not the obligation to make changes. And improving your finances isn't just about the math. It's really about mindset and some discipline. Today's facilitator believes that talking about money is really good for everyone and will lead to more meaningful plans, thoughtful decisions, and ultimately a happier life. She also believes that when you understand and take action to kind of right the ship of your finances, you break free from stresses, and that makes you a, a better or more productive, better employee and more productive at work. So I'm really excited to welcome who I consider a friend and colleague, Maggie Tucker, to the mic today. She's the founder and host of the weekly podcast, Inside Out Money, and the founder and former co-host of Friends on Fire podcast. Inside Out Money is a personal finance podcast and brand focused on redefining wealth from the inside out. Maggie early retired last year at the age of 41 on the same day as her husband, Greg, after spending 20 some years in corporate America in a variety of leadership roles with global brands. Together, Maggie and her husband leveraged financial freedom to take the plunge into a new phase of life. And lately they've been spending time together with their three kids, traveling, volunteering in our community and at the kids' school, pursuing hobbies and her passions and managing her real estate properties. She's really passionate about lifestyle ch changes that can save money, about living simply and helping people on their life's journey. And the reason I know Maggie is she is a proud Emory MBA alum. So as with all of our webinars, Maggie's gonna spend about the first 30 minutes sharing her insights uh, and her, her experience informed insights, as I like to say. Uh, we invite you to post questions to the Q&A box or to the chat. Maggie's happy to answer those along the way. And we've also reserved time at the end as usual. A recording of today's webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. And a member of our team will post that link in the chat if they haven't already. And if you'd like to take a deeper dive into some of the topics that you've heard previously, always check out our short courses on our website. So Maggie, it's so great to see you again. Thanks so much for being with us. And we're so excited to hear from you today. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sure Okay, can. just checking. Um, well, thank you so much, Pam. I really appreciate the introduction and I'm excited to be here today. I'll be honest, I, I envisioned that I was talking to a lot of people in Atlanta. And I love seeing the chat because it was Nepal, which I think was my favorite one, uh, someone from Bangladesh, um, Oregon, just people all over. So it was fun. I'm not sure who started it, but it was fun to see where everybody is uh, joining from this morning or this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so I do appreciate <clears throat> you all joining and thank you so much for having me today. I am excited to be here. Um, for those of you who haven't seen Goizueta Business School in a while, here's what it looks like. It's beautiful. Um, I, I'm excited for this talk today because my hope is that by the end of this presentation, you will be thinking differently about your own personal finances and, and your life as a result. And it, this could be in a really tiny way. This could be in a larger, more meaningful way. Um, but I would like to get to a place where you guys are thinking differently about something based on this discussion. Um, so I wanna introduce myself a little bit more. You got the you know kind of textbook introduction um, from Pam. That's me, by the way, right there in an outfit that I definitely was forced to wear because I would not have picked that outfit out on my own. Um, but I just wanna to, to bring together kind of a, a quick story about just who I am, money and what we're here to talk about today. Um, and 
I'll start it with just, again, this is, you know, again, when I was a kid and forced to wear this, this is a little bit more of uh, me and what I wanted to be wearing. But I had a pretty kind of normal average childhood. I grew up in Atlanta. Um, I was a very driven, creative kid. And I had a lot of things that I wanted to do. There were many different phases of kind of what I wanted to be when I grew up, if you will. Um, but I was a really driven kid. And it when I look at kind of my childhood and the, the path I went on and the trajectory of, you know, going to college and eventually going to grad school at Emory and et cetera, I always had this view of what the American dream was, right? And so I think I was, I look at this photo with this is me and my brother, by the way, probably, I was probably around five years old here. Um, and I, I, I love the members only jackets because if you, we were children of the eighties. And if you grew up in the eighties, you probably also remember and owned a members only jacket. And I was like living the dream, you know, I had my pink members only jacket. Um, and I really was living the dream, right? Like I, when I, why well, fast forward from, you know, that, that five-year-old little girl with, by the way, a terrible haircut that I'm just not sure what was that. I often like ask my parents what was going on with uh, my clothing and my haircuts as a kid, but um, I was like living the dream. I had been very successful. I was doing very well financially. I was happy in my personal life and I had accomplished these things professionally that I believed would make me really happy. And they did in many ways, but there also were, there also not were, but was all of these things where I was just starting to change what I thought happiness looked like, right? I was changing, I think. And I was changing my view and mindset of what I thought happiness truly was. And, you know, there were all these different things that were happening, you know, as I was getting out of my 20s of, you know, I started to have, <clears throat> I had my daughter. Um, I was very stressed at work. I, my dad died. I just, you know, pe more and more people close to me were dying of things unexpected and, you know, health related, just, uh, or lifestyle health related and a lot of different things. And I was just having all of these, you know, uh, uh, not to be cliche, but like life is short moments. Right. And, and then I learned about fire around those same times, you know, around when all of these other things were happening. And I just was, I was starting to have some you know, you could call it dis disillusionment, whatever you want, but I was just starting to think, you know, my priorities are changing. And I say, when I learned about FIRE, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but it stands for financial independence, retire early. It was just the, it was for me, it was the learning that there were different paths in life and that a little bit of like a wake up call of like, oh, I have choices about how I spend my life. And like my finances can impact the ability of flexibility uh, and freedom that I have in my life or the amount of flexibility and freedom that I have in my life. And so <clears throat> for me, it was just this, it wasn't one moment. It was a period of five to 10 years when my priorities were evolving. And when I was starting to realize I had a different dream, right? And I went from thinking like, oh, I've got everything that I thought I ever wanted, yet somehow it's not that it's not enough, but it's not the right stuff. And and, and that was, you know, for me, everybody is um, very different and in, in what is <clears throat> important to them. But I want to go back for a moment because I think this is uh, just an interesting um, piece, piece of my story in particular, but just of many people's stories when they think about their finances. So um, I go back to COVID, right? And I, I think of, you know, March, 2020, and I, I was actually recently thinking about this and I was like, how, how long is it until we can no longer refer to co you know, COVID times? Cause that is so frequently kind of a, you know, you hear people say like BC, like before COVID and after COVID, but um, I don't think we're there yet. So I'm still going to refer to COVID here today, but <clears throat> um, just a lot of people I remember have very specific stories of what was happening to them in March of 2020, like what they were going through. They remember it in their life. It was a very unique time for all of us. And I think we all can kind of go back and remember like what was going on in our lives in March of 2020. Um, and for me, again, back to what I was talking about before, on the outside, it looked like 
I was doing great, right? I had I had a dream job. I was a vice president at um, Intercontinental Hotels Group, IHG Hotels and Resorts. And I <clears throat> was financially making more money than I ever thought I would be making. And I, I, I more was at a point where, um, sorry for a second. I think everyone around me in that time was super stressed about losing their jobs. I remember hearing stories and talking to colleagues and it was just, it was, it, especially in the hotel industry also, keep in mind, I worked in the global hotel industry when all of a sudden travel got shut down literally overnight. <clears throat> and we had huge operations in China, which is where COVID hit first. And so it was a very stressful time. And a lot of people were stressed about losing their jobs. And I'm curious, just really quickly to throw in the chat for a minute, how many people, or not how many people, but put a little comment of, yes, stress, write whatever you want. But when you go back to March of 2020, were you stressed about losing your job? Were you stressed financially? Were you stressed about the financial impact that this was going to have? Or were you just feeling, you know, <clears throat> great and life was continuing on and, you know, no big deal. And I'm so sorry. I just saw someone say that they lost their mom um, from COVID-19. I'm sure that was a whole different, um, I'm sure you weren't even thinking about your job at that point. Um, and, and someone said, yes, yeah, stressed. And I lost my job. Um, stressed about dying, worked in healthcare. Um, hundred percent stressed. Yes. Laid off in the first two weeks. Yeah. A lot. I mean, a, a lot of people at IHG were furloughed. Um, and people saying, you know, not, not uh, <clears throat> stressed financially, but totally stressful, um, stressed, but in hindsight overreacted. I think many would say that. Um, yeah. So uh, yes, uh, this is interesting just to see people's uh, responses here. Um, some people working a lot. I mean, you had, you had all these people on opposite ends of the spectrum too. You had people working these ridiculous amounts because of the industry they were in. And then you had people with like nothing to do. And there were actually some companies that had some pretty unique responses to that. Um, but yeah, a lot of people were stressed about losing their job. And I don't say this to brag about anything, but I was stressed about having a job at the time. And again, a lot of it was because of what we were just talking about in terms of just where I had gotten to uh, I was going to say emotionally in terms of just the reality of my lifestyle at that point is I was ready to, to be out before COVID hit. I had had conversations with HR to say, I'm going to retire from this company. Like I'm going to, I've got a couple more years left in me, but I don't plan on working anywhere other than IHG. And I was very open about that. And it was a, um, it was a scary conversation to have, um, but I was not afraid during COVID. I mean, I was afraid of all the things everyone's talking about. My mom get my mom lived in a senior community. I was I was worried about things like that, but I was not worried financially. And it's because I had been preparing. I wasn't preparing for COVID, but I had been preparing and I was prepared to not work ever again, if not for a very, very long time. And so for me, I was kind of the exact opposite. And it was a weird place to be in too, because everyone around me is super stressed. Um, and I, I specifically remember hearing that somebody that was at my level, so a vice president, and I generally know the like compensation package for a vice president. Um, I had, I heard that they had said to a, someone in HR, uh, I can't lose my job. I can't afford to keep my child in private school. And I remember hearing that and I don't, I'm like, I don't say this to pass judgment, but I do say this from, I'm, I'm just going to sound like I'm passing judgment to be clear, but to hear that from someone, when I knew the amount of money they were making, something is not right in how you're managing your finances. And that's a really stressful position to be in. Right. And my goal today is if you were already not is to start managing your finances in a way so that you don't ever end up in a situation where when a COVID happens or when something else happens that you can't predict, like one of your aging parents is sick or something like that, or if something happens with one of your children, who knows, that you're prepared, right? It could be a bad thing that happens that you need to be prepared for. It could be some really good opportunity that happens that you want to be prepared to be able to take and jump at. Um, but my uh, passion lately and what I believe is important is being able to 
have this freedom and this ability and, and your, the way you manage your finances can get you there. And I'll get more specifically and tactically into what I mean and, and what I personally recommend for people. Um, but the last piece of the story is, as Pam said, I did end up after COVID, but yeah, it, it's uh, hard to say after COVID because COVID is still around. Um, but <clears throat> in terms of, you know, when things got a little bit, you know, more back to normal, I did finally take the plunge and early retired. And my husband had been with the same, he had worked for Piedmont Healthcare for 20 years, the same job uh, since he got out of grad school. Um, I had been at IHG for 15 years, a big chunk of my 20 year career. And uh, we both decided, we thought it'd be fun. And so on the same day, we gave a lot of, no I actually, I, if anyone ever wants to talk about this, I gave like nine months notice. It's way too much notice and you shouldn't give that much notice for a number of reasons, but I wanted to be very transparent about what I was doing. Um, but anyways, when we both early retired, we went on uh, to celebrate with ourselves and our kids. We went to Europe for six weeks, which I also don't recommend six weeks in Europe with three kids. It was a little bit too long. I, I like a shorter couple week, two to three week trips with your kids. Um, anyways, asides, if anyone ever wants to talk about those topics. Um, so we finally, uh, we finally did this big transition in our lives. Um, and what I really want to talk about today is figuring out what matters most to you and thinking about aligning your personal finances to support those goals in your life. And for me right now, what I like doing stuff that matters and I like talking about things that I think matter. And I think this topic really, really matters because we'll talk about this more, but finance is like, and money in general, we're all raised to think is such a taboo topic, but it shouldn't be. It's one of the biggest things that can provide flexibility and freedom in our life. And we have, just based on the audience I'm talking to today, if you have a tie to Emory or went to Goizueta Business School, you likely have been in some decent financial positions in your life. And you've been in a position to be able to make different choices with how you spend your money and what you're doing with your money. And there's there's so many things, so many kind of decision points in our lives where we can make decisions that give us more freedom or that take more freedom away from us, right? And um, so that's one of the things I really want to want to dig in today. But my point here is that this really matters, right? It matters a lot to me. And I hope it matters to you because I hope as we talk more about this, you'll understand the role that making some financial uh, changes in a positive direction in your life could have in terms of your overall happiness. So let me talk about a little bit about why this matters. I don't think anyone will be surprised to hear that money is the number one cause of stress in the U.S. That's not a um, not a surprise in any way. A couple other kind of interesting statistics are um, 77 percent of Americans feel some level of what's considered considerable anxiety about their finances from arguing with loved ones. They don't want to open the mail, answer the phone because of bill collectors, um, guilty about how they're spending money, worried or anxious about the future. I mean, a lot of the things we talked about um, were just heavily exacerbated during COVID. Um, but ultimately, financial stress has a really big impact on your health, too. So there's a ton of studies around how being stressed about your money can increase your blood pressure, can cause um, an upset stomach, insomnia, all of these things. Um, literally like skin problems can be caused um, by financial stress. And so it, it has a really big impact on your health, which is usually through stress because stress in general can have a very negative impact on your health. Another stat that I think is very interesting, which I don't think people will be surprised about, but who knows is, and, and I, I'll say first, sorry, I like to make the point, this is not a pitch for quitting your job, right? This is a pitch for having a rich and happy life. And how you manage your money and how you prepare for the future, and I'll talk more about the connection of why if it's not there yet for you, is what can lead you to have much more flexibility and a feeling of uh, the feeling of knowing that you will be okay regardless of what happens to you is truly a priceless feeling. It is more important and better than the feeling of like buying new stuff to me at least. So it, it this is, I always, I, one thing I like to preface is 
it's called personal finance for a reason. It's very personal. So you, you may have very different views. And so many of our views also are rooted in how we grew up around money, which is a whole, whole different uh, topic we could dive into. Um, but a stat here that I think is interesting is 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Um, so this is nearly like four out of five households cannot cover an unexpected job or bill. And, and you might hear this and think, oh, that's a you know, lower income portion of America. And <clears throat> that's what's driving that stat up. That is not true. You heard the story I told about someone who during COVID who was making, and I gotta say like a lot of money uh, was thought they could no longer pay the private school tuition if they lost their job, right? That is considered, you can make a half a million dollars a year and be paycheck to paycheck. You can make $20,000 a year and be paycheck to paycheck. You can make a million dollars a year and be paycheck to paycheck. And so um, that paycheck to paycheck stat is not about how much money you make. It's about how much money you spend, which we'll talk about compared to how much money you make. Um, and then the other thing that I really love making this point because it is very true. And I personally found this to be incredibly true. When I realized, so the point is employees who have, who are strong financially and who have managed their money well and again have an emergency fund aren't stressed about some you know thing that comes up unexpectedly etc they're better at their jobs because they're less stressed they have less anxiety they have more confidence in what they're doing and my personal experience in this is when i started to realize i didn't have to work again or that i had a long runway if i wanted to take a lot of time off or anything else i was much different and better at my job, right? I was doing things, and I'll give you some very specific examples. Actually, let me give them to you in a minute. Before I get to that, um, I love this other point too. So this is the wellness wheel. This is taught in medical schools um, all around the world as all of the different uh, aspects or facets of what makes somebody overall healthy, right? It's not just your physical health. That's one piece of it. Um, and what I think is so interesting about this is obviously financial is on here, um, but, sorry, waiting for this transition. We talk about all these things at work. We don't really ever talk about financial and I'll leave spiritual off because there's many reasons why we don't talk about that at work, but we don't talk about financial. And what's interesting is when companies do talk about financial, they'll have, you know, like someone from the 401k administrator come in and often they're kind of pushing their managed fee services or things that aren't actually necessarily in someone's best interest, but that's a free service provided. And so the company can do it or, you know, they're doing health steps challenges and other physical related, you know, in the physical realm. Um, they're putting energy against that because that lowers their insurance costs. There's a financial incentive to your company doing that. Um, we don't do the financial one. And, and again, when we do, it's kind of, in my opinion, it's actually the wrong angle, which is not having the 401k administrator come in and try to pitch some product or they'll have a financial planner come in and try to pitch some product. Um, and I've heard the advice that some of these people have given. I'm like, it's not necessarily in your best interest and it's not um, the best advice. And so going back, my, but my point there is we don't talk about it enough, right? And companies, I believe companies should talk about it enough. And I'll I'll wrap up on a point related to this, so we'll come back to it too. But real quick on the point I was making earlier, your your finances can make you a better employee, right? So this, this is about um, having a richer and happier life, being better at your job, right? It's not a I I happen to have retired early and it's, you know, it's got its pros and cons that come with it. I'm happy. I we, I talk about it on various podcast episodes if anyone's ever curious to hear what uh, post-retirement life is like. Um, but improving your finances makes you a better employee, right? You worry, you just don't care about as much stuff. You're not caught up in office politics. You lead with more confidence and authenticity. I once had somebody after a team event, like an offsite event that we were hosting and that I was speaking at, she was, um, asking me, she kind of came up and was like asking me for career advice. And she was like, how are you able to so kind of be yourself and not care what anyone thinks. And I, when she first said that, I was thinking like, what did I say up there where it seems like I don't care what anyone thinks? But, um, and it's funny, I kind of, I went into this whole thing about money with her. She, I think she was like looking for, I think she was expecting to hear a different level of career advice. And I actually was like, 
well, it's, it's a financial thing. I was like, I don't care because I'm not afraid of losing my job. I'm not acting from a place of fear. I am coming from a place of confidence and authenticity and feeling comfortable being myself. And that makes you much happier at work, at home, I believe in all facets of your life. And so it's funny, they always say like money can't buy happiness. I don't think it can in the spirit of what that uh, phrase is looking after, but it can buy you happiness in terms of confidence and freedom and flexibility and other things. And so we're going to talk about some more very tactical things for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So there's, you know, all those quotes about, you know, the best time to improve something was, you know, yesterday or the best time to buy into the stock market was, you know, 10 years ago. The next best time is right now. So this is not meant to, if you feel like you've, you know, not done things the way you wish you had done, like there's no point in focusing on the past. All we can do is focus on where we are now and try to make positive decisions moving forward. And so that is one thing that I would um, very much challenge you all to do. So while, uh, before I get into this real quick, I have one question for people that I would love for you guys to put in the chat and we'll just, let's just do it as a yes, no. So it's a quick one, but if you have a comment on it, feel free to throw that in too. I would like to know how many people on this call know their net worth and I will define net worth for you. So I'm getting some yeses. Good. That's, that's awesome. Sort of. Um, your net worth is all of your assets. So it could be your home, brokerage account, your 401k account, cash, et cetera. I'm defining it for the person who asked. Um, minus all of your debts, mortgage, credit card debt. Uh, you might still owe Emory money or somebody who gave you student loans. Um, so assets minus your debts, that's your net worth. And yeah, it goes up and down based on the uh, market if you have a lot of money in the market. But uh, yeah, I think like a lot of yeses some, a handful of no's. Um, I like the, like, I think I could calculate it, but I don't know the number offhand. Um, I only check it about once a year. I think that is a um, good number. We'll be out of debt in three years. That means you know your net worth and you, you know how long it's going to take and you forecasted it, which is awesome. Um, just give it a second. Yes. Needs work. I know whether I'm solvent. Okay, so I want to start to talk about some of the more tactical financial stuff of this, and we're going to come back to the net worth piece in a minute. Um, so it is not about how much you make, it's about how much you save. Yes, it's great if you're focused on um, making more money, if you're focused on you know asking for a raise, et cetera. Sorry, I'm trying to fix some slide transition things. Um, that is great, but what really matters is how much you save. And so I want to just show you a couple of examples and I'm going to, for the sake of simplicity, I want to show it to you. Um, I'm going to show it to you for a hundred thousand dollars and then for $300,000. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through these quickly because I think you'll get the point here. But if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, <clears throat> and then think, think back to the stat about how many like almost 80% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. This is how you're living paycheck to paycheck when you even make what is considered a you know higher amount of money. So if you take home $100,000 a year, and I'm oversimplifying this, but and then you spend 110, you're in debt. So thinking about how long it will take you to save for one year of retirement, or I'm going to call it freedom, but we can call it retirement, freedom, whatever you'd like. So uh, if you are spending as much as you make, forever, right? You're never going to be able to retire because you'll never save enough. If you are spending $95,000, which a lot of people who are making a hundred are, they're saving maybe $5,000 a year. You have to work 19 years. And I'm, I'm saying this off, you know, your expenses, right? So that's how I know how long you have to work. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking inflation out of here. This, I'm oversimplifying this to make this point, but you have to work 19 years to earn one year of retirement, one year of your, to save for one year of your expenses, right? And so you have to work 19 years to earn one year of freedom. That sounds not enjoyable in my opinion. And when you even think about that, you're thinking, you know, what I'm, what I'm earning for my future for working for this whole year, it just, it's a little bit of a, a depressing stat, I think. Um, and so, sorry, my slide moved excellently. So if you're making 75, if you're making hundred and you spend 75, then you're saving $25,000 a year. 
Now you have, now the numbers are getting way, way better, right? Now you have to only work three years to earn one year. Now let's flip all the way to $25,000. You're only spending $25,000 a year, which there are people who are doing this in Atlanta even. Um, you, now, some of them might be like living with their parents for a couple of years and doing some, you know, house hacking or very creative things. Um, but you're able to save $75,000 of your income every year, which means in three months, you're earning a whole year of freedom, retirement, whatever you want to call it. Now, I think another interesting example is let's go off a much bigger salary to so $300,000 a year, right? Same examples. I'm going to pass through the first couple. You're able to live on $100,000 a year, which is very realistic. I have... I, we have podcasts where we share our, I don't share my income and net worth publicly for a number of reasons, but I, we do very openly share our family's expenses and like how it breaks down and what we spend on travel. And there's a number of um, podcast episodes on friends on fire and on inside out money that outline that we spend about a hundred thousand dollars a year as a family of five We have three kids. So um, in this example, and my point is just, it's very realistic that you could live off of a hundred thousand dollars a year. And we travel to Europe every, I mean, we travel somewhere internationally every year. Like we, we don't live incredibly frugally. Um, we, you could, in this example, then you could save $200,000 a year and every six months you're saving enough to earn a year's worth of freedom, a year's worth of your retirement. So I, I just share these examples to remind people like that people are often so focused on how much they make. And yes, you want to continue to manage your career. You want to continue to get paid what you deserve and what is fair and ask for raises when you should and push for promotions and everything else. But so much of this is about how much you're able to save. And I think that that piece kind of clicking for people is incredibly important. Okay. The other thing that I think is important for people to wrap their head around is the opportunity cost of spending that you're making now versus that in the future, particularly when you're younger. So if you spend an extra 20,000 on a car at the age of 25, that $20,000 with some average <clears throat> performance um, in the stock market or the historical average performance in the stock market can grow through compound interest to $300,000 at age 65. So I often go back and think about all the decisions I made in my early 20s that were like, you know, things I was doing, buying a house, just a bunch of different things I was doing. And they would literally be worth millions now, right? And and again, I'm I'm not in the like deprivation camp of, you know, making yourself miserable uh, for different financial goals, but I am in the like, there's trade-offs and being very intentional and values-based about your spending. And being educated, right? Like if someone had said, I didn't know this. I wasn't, uh, I just wasn't aware of this when I was 20 or when I was 25 even, right? First thing I did when I got out of school and I got what I thought was a pretty high paying job is like, I bought my first car, my first new car that I'd ever had. I don't think my parents ever bought a new car in their entire life. I know that for a fact, actually, they never bought a new car. Um, and so that was like a huge thing of like, oh, I just thought I was like, you know, it, and and it was in, in hindsight, like I did not need a new car. I could have bought a car that was a few years old and still very nice. And anyways, you get the point. There's an opportunity cost in our money. And then I'm going to just run through this quickly. So this is Steve Jobs quote, your time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. I love this quote from Steve Jobs and, and Steve Jobs is no longer alive, which is, you know, very sad and tragic. Um, but another thing about Steve Jobs that was interesting, and this isn't his quote, but there's something that you've probably heard a lot, which is we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. My point about Steve Jobs is he was famous for constantly wearing like a uniform, which was often some old like torn up Levi's, as you can see here, and a black shirt. And there's like, that's what he wore for like 20, 30 years. And he didn't, it was, there was a, there's a lot of people who are like into uniforms and it just makes like your mornings easier and there's all these things. But, but the, the crux of it is he did not care what other people thought, right? And caring what other people think is incredibly expensive. Like when you're doing things for yourself financially, that's great. But often we're doing things for other people, right? Like if I go back to my 20 year old self and I think like, was that car for me or was it, and maybe it was partially for me, or was it because I wanted to look cool on like, and I don't know why I thought I was like looking cool in my Honda Accord, but I was just like, I wanted, you know, I, it's so hard to even like break, <laughs> break down these old, you know, thought patterns, but you just want to 
really think internally about what you are doing for yourself versus what you are doing for other people, right? When you are making decisions about your home and your car, and I'm going to remind you something. We have a whole Friends on Fire episode that I think is called Nobody Cares. And it's just a reminder that people, sorry, I just saw a comment that said dumb decisions on my part in my 20s. Um, that, by the way, let me answer a quick question just because I saw it in the thing. So in that, in those examples, um, I didn't include taxes. So I, you can include taxes in the math. Those are simple examples to make the point about how much we, it is about how much we spend. We'll talk about things to reduce your taxable income, but yes, you need to figure taxes into all things. Um, and they should be, but those numbers are still, still hold true. And yes, you know, some amount of taxes is in there. So in that hundred thousand dollar example, um, you, there are people who live on $25,000. They're not even making $100,000 necessarily, but there are tons of examples of people. I'm not suggesting anyone get that lean, uh, but there are people who do it. And again, they're often doing house hacking. They've reduced their housing costs. Um, they live with their parents. They have a duplex. They rent out one side and make as much as their mortgages. There's a ton of very creative things people are doing. Um, I have a good friend who's a teacher who lives in Colorado and she lives on less than $25,000 a year. She's super frugal. Um, okay. Back to nobody cares about your stuff. And she doesn't care about what other people think. So she doesn't buy flashy stuff. She's incredibly frugal. And I just think the reminder of nobody cares about your stuff. They're often so busy worrying about themselves. They do not care about you. And I like to remind people too. And if they do care, if they do somehow care about you, um, more because of something you have, like those aren't probably the people you want in your life anyways, um, but the point is, you know, cost, just lifestyle inflation, right? Like as things continue to inflate, everything around that costs more. So when you have a more expensive car, it requires more expensive insurance. And there's just all these things that very quickly inflate. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to speed quickly through a couple of things. This is an example I love because I often, <clears throat> I think my kids are probably sick of this because this actually happens in our house, but you know, we'll drive through the neighborhood and the kids will see some big house and their reaction is, oh, wow, they must be rich. Look at that big house. And then they get a whole like lecture from me. And because my reaction when I see a big house like this, and this is genuine because back to those stats about how many people are living paycheck to paycheck, even people with this car and this house, my reaction is like, can they afford that house? I hope they didn't go into a crazy amount of debt for all of that. Like what happens if someone gets sick or they lose their job tomorrow. And like, is all that making them happy? And so I just say that because I think about um, the differences between outward appearances and what's actually happening behind the scenes, right? And I think you you cannot equate what you see in terms of somebody's like, quote, you know, rich or wealthy lifestyle into them actually having strong finances. And I think that mindset shift is so important. So everything I just said, is to shift your mindset, right? Like I know those examples I gave on the numbers are, are super um, rudimentary and overly simplified, but it's to make the point about, it is not how much we make, it's about how much we spend. And there are things we can do to control and grow our net worth. And so I hope, and, and to you know quit caring about what other people think and you know all these things that can help your finances and your mindset has to shift. It's one of the reasons we call the new podcast Inside Out Money is, so much of your financial decisions and habits and what's ingrained in us, it's psychological, right? It, like we know what we should be doing with our money, but people often aren't doing it because of our mind, right? And because we we are focused on the wrong things and we're, I shouldn't say the wrong things, but focused on different things that are not helping us financially. So I want to, this is a good takeaway too. I think this deck will be shared after, but you're welcome to uh, take a screenshot of this too. This is my like checklist in terms of something incredibly actionable. So actionable, excuse me. So when we talk about um, what you, when we talk about the mindset and everything I was just talking about, that piece I think is critical. And that's part of kind of creating a goal and knowing your why. And again, it may not be leaving your job. It might be having flexibility or wanting to move to part-time or wanting to take some time off um, while your kids are still in the house and things like that. Um, the other 
huge things, which is one of the reasons why I was curious how many people already track their net worth are um, tracking your net worth is critical, right? Like if you don't measure something, it's hard for it to get better over time. And I track mine monthly, but you don't need to track it that often. There's a lot of just like stock market fluctuations month to month. Tracking it quarterly, twice a year, once a year is even okay. Um, but tracking your net worth and having a clear list of all of your accounts and all of your all of your assets and all of your um, uh, debts and then the total, which is your net worth. Tracking your expenses is critical. <clears throat> and and tracking your expenses, I often equate to every now and then, you know, I, I don't know that it's um, healthy psychologically or physically to like track your calories all the time, but sometimes it is. Sometimes when you really are trying to lose some weight or you have a health goal you're trying to reach, um, you don't realize how many calories are in certain things. And so tracking your calories can be really helpful. And we equate, we actually have a, a, a podcast episode where we kind of compare the two. But tracking your expenses is the same thing, right? For you for you to truly get better with some of your money, you have to understand where your money is going. And for all of the calculations that you might want to do to look at you having some freedom, more freedom and um, potentially being able to retire and other things in the future, you need to know roughly what you spend a year yourself or as your family. Um, I think another thing that I think is critically important is learning to manage your money yourself. You don't need a financial planner. I've got a couple of uh, podcast episodes about this. Um, you can manage your money yourself, flipping to the right side, buying simple broad-based index funds that track uh, the entire stock, stock market and are diversified by nature and what they are. Um, finding an accountability partner can really help. Could be your spouse, could be a friend, could be a colleague. Um, and then reviewing your progress. Again, being able to see your net worth, even if many people's net worth, when they first start tracking it, they don't want to because they're like, well, it's going to be negative and it's depressing. That's important, right? It's okay if it's negative, right? You, you need just as much as if it's positive, you're trying to grow it. If it's negative, you're trying to get it to positive. And seeing what that is and where your different, again, assets and liabilities are is very important. And it's an important step. And having that like net worth mindset can uh, dramatically improve your finances over time. Um, so my big recommendations. And again, some of these, depending on your level of kind of financial savviness are incredibly basic and obvious. Um, but many people aren't doing these things. And so for, for many, these aren't um, necessarily uh, top of mind and what everyone's thinking of, but dramatically reducing your spending. I And like I said, it, it is on while optimizing for happiness. And so there are a lot of things like how much you're selling. If anyone here is paying more than 35 to $40 a month for their cell phone bill, unless you have a very unique need, like you travel internationally full-time or something like that, um, I you sh you're probably paying too much for your cell phone. And I'm talking about unlimited data, high quality um, coverage. So those are examples of like having a cheaper cell phone bill does not uh, make you any less happy, right? Uh, getting cheaper car insurance does not make you, there's some commodities that we pay for that do not change our happiness, but where there's a lot of savings potential in our budgets and what we're spending. Um, I think everyone should have an emergency fund of at least six months of living expenses. I personally, if you can swing it, um, prefer one to two years, which is you know very aggressive. Um, I think everyone as early as possible in life should be trying to increase and max out their tax advantage accounts. And so in that example of that hundred thousand dollars, where the person you know was mentioning in the comments about taxes, if you are maxing out the IRS's limit, in addition you're going to get your company's match on whatever that is. But if you're maxing out the IRS's limit of twenty two thousand five hundred, and it's even more if you're self employed because there's some solo four hundred one k things that you can do. Um, if you're maxing that amount, your hundred thousand dollars, you're not getting taxed on a hundred thousand dollars. You're getting taxed on a hundred thousand dollars. Minus for easy math, I'm going to say 20 grand. So you're getting taxed on 80 grand. So you've reduced your taxable income and you've put things into a tax advantaged um, account that will grow tax free over time. Um, and so opt, uh, maximizing your 401k is one of the maxing out your 401k is one of the biggest, most impactful things you can do. Um, and the earlier, the better. And I didn't start maxing out my 401k. I say the earlier, the better, but it's never too late to start. <clears throat> I did not start maxing mine out until I was in my like mid thirties. You can, I maxed it out for probably five or six years before I left. Um, so you, you can start these things later 
And it's just, it's never too late, right? But the earlier, the better, I think is an important point. Aggressively paying down any debt. I am a big fan. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. I know I'm running a little long. I'm a big fan of paying down uh, all debt, including your mortgage, even if it's at a low interest rate. Um, it's, it is a uh, emotional mindset decision and it is, feels amazing to not have any housing costs and to know that again, you're just, re you're, you're further reducing what you need to live on every year and, and reducing your financial needs. Um, I talked about it earlier, but just, uh, many, for a long time, I was on the hunt for like the perfect financial planner and was missing that what I really needed to be doing was buying uh, simple broad-based index funds like VTSAX if you're with Vanguard, FCROX if you're with Fidelity. There's there's a ton of different funds like that that are um, incredibly low fee. They track the overall market. Um, and then potentially you might want to diversify over time in if you want to get into things like real estate, which I think is a, a whole different detailed discussion. Um, but these are the things that I think are important in a little bit in order also in terms of the, the right side of the list. Um, one other really quick bonus thing, if you want to take this a step further, especially because I would imagine many people on this call are leaders, manage people, you can also help someone else. So people think that money is a taboo conversation, but people do want to have this conversation. An interesting thing happened for me when I started the Friends on Fire podcast, I was still at IHG and it became known that I was doing this thing. And all of a sudden it like opened the door to talk about money. And I had conversations with, I managed a fairly large team and I thought I kind of, you know, knew many of my team members. I started having much deeper, more insightful, personal conversations with people as soon as I opened the door that we could talk about this topic. Um, and so I would encourage you to have this conversation with your employees. And again, I'm not, you gotta be careful how you go in and have a conversation about money. One of the things, and here are some tips on it, but one of the things that I would say is start with the one thing you all have in common, which is if you work together, you work for the same company, you have the same benefits. Start talking about your benefits and why if, are you, like we had a deferred compensation plan at IHG. It's an amazing program that many people did not leverage and um, start talking about 401k and are people maximizing their 401k and what is it invested in and things like that. You know, you need to approach it cautiously and respectively, make sure people want to have the conversation. But in my experience, a lot of people want to have the conversation. You just have to open the door and, and start it in some ways and, you know, be vulnerable, share your own story and weaknesses. And um, I think other things you can do to keep it a little softer, like suggest some different books or podcasts and uh, blogs that you uh, want to discuss. You can bring in an external speaker. Um, I've actually had talks at different companies um, to have conversations similar to the ones that uh, we just had today. I know I'm running a little bit long, so I want to wrap it up and leave um, some time for questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's time. I'm going back to the chat to uh, look at some questions and comments from people. And I know, Pam, you will be doing the same. Yeah. So Maggie, there's one question that um, we let fly by really quickly uh, before I stopped you to say, hey, can you talk more about this? So Lauren, when you were back on the slide about um, kind of training yourself to think differently, the very last bullet says cost grow exponentially while you inflate your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, she's, she just asked if you could elaborate a little bit more on that bullet. Yeah. So, there, so there's two points there. One is just generally lifestyle inflation, which is the concept that, you know, as you start to make more money, you spend more money and you inflate your lifestyle. And that's one of the things I was... Uh, that made me very financially successful in many ways is I kind of kept my lifestyle flat, right? I was around a lot of people that were buying bigger houses, moving to expensive neighborhoods, putting in swimming pools, like spending their bonuses every year on like these crazy, in my view, you know, like big ostentatious things. And I wasn't right. I was taking my bonus every year and I was saving it. Um, and so there are just people, because I was already happy, right? I didn't need more. I knew I didn't need more physical stuff, right? I just was like, I'd like less stress in my life, right? I'd like to work fewer hours and, you know, just have more time. Um, but so that's one point is just the concept of lifestyle inflation is important to understand. The point in that bullet specifically was as you have more expensive stuff, it actually further inflates because it costs you more to maintain. So when you buy a bigger, more expensive house, it costs more to maintain. Your yard's bigger. 
If you do it, either it takes more time or it costs more to hire people to do it. If you have a swimming pool, they're ridiculously expensive to maintain. Um, if you have a more expensive car, car insurance costs more, right? Mm -hmm. So, so as you own more stuff, the costs associated with that stuff also inflates, which was the point of that bullet. Got it. Um, you talked about this on one of your podcasts, but Alicia asked, where does saving for your kid's college come into all of this? Yeah. So, um, it, it should be in there. Right. And so, um, it depends how you want to do it, but yeah, like we, when we think about, you know, us retiring, like we basically pre-save for our kids' college because we don't have money. We have money coming in through some rental properties and other things, but it's kind of just like a little bit extra. And so, uh, you want to include whatever your priorities and saving goals are, which are your retirement, your kids' college, and, and again, whatever your views are on saving for college. So I have, my kids are going to have way more money than I ever had for college, but I'm not fully bankrolling a Harvard education for my kids, right? They're going to have some choices to make, which is, hey, if you stay in state, you're going to have a full, you're going to, you're not going to pay a cent. You're not going to have any loans. Everything will be taken care of for you. If you choose to go to a private school or an out-of-state school and you don't get some level of funding, like you're going to have some skin in the game. And like, that's an important part of, that's my belief in college, but everyone's is different. If one of your priorities is you want to have, you know, what might need to be $500,000 in the bank per kid for them to do anything they want in college, which I wouldn't recommend putting in a five, all of that in a 529 personally, um, cause it's less flexible if they end up with a scholarship or something. Um, but you want to save for your kid's college, which for, for me is a mix of in a 529 plan and also just in brokerage funds that I can, you know, uh, sell as I need to, um, when they're ready for college. Okay. Uh, okay. There's also a ton of questions about what I use to track expenses. So I'll just hit that yeah. briefly. Yeah. Um, and we talk about this in detail in a number of podcast episodes, which you can you can go to Friends on Fire and Inside Out Money and just in the search box, you can type expense tracking and you'll see both episodes or you'll see actually a bunch of episodes, more than two. Um, but we use Mint, which is a free app by Intuit. A number of people uh, mentioned it. Some people love an app called You Need a Budget, which is Y-N-A-B is the name of the app in the app store. It's a paid app. It's about $100 a year. It's a little bit more of like a user-friendly one. Mint is a little bit clunky, but it's been around for a long time and it works. And now we use our Mint stuff to like keep things organized and we dump it all into Excel. Um, I know people, my old podcast co-host at Friends on Fire, he did it all manually in Excel. He'd like keep his receipts and like literally he 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 liked the pain of like everything I spend, I have to type into Excel. And I was like, I like to just have it in Mint and dump it into a big data dump. Um, some people use, I know people who use personal capital to track their net worth, which someone mentioned their personal capital is now called Empower. Um, I like someone who said your financial advisor should not be your accountability partner. Thank you very much to whoever said that. And no offense to financial planners or advisors, but their incentives are sometimes a little bit out of whack on your priorities. Yeah. So Maggie, I love this. There's several questions I want to try to get to, but this is kind of a fun one. Um, Anthony asked, what are your thoughts about retiring or working remotely from another country like Portugal, Italy, Croatia, et cetera, where the cost of living is yeah. lower than in the U.S.? And of course, that also brought to mind the retired toddlers. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is actually a friend of mine from college. Um so my thoughts are that that formally is called like geo arbitrage, which is when you're purposely going to live somewhere else because it's cheaper cost of living. There's also a lot of people that go to like Portugal, um, not because it's even a cheaper cost of living, because it's a higher quality of life, right? There's less crime. There, it's, a, it's just a beautiful setting. Um, I'm a big fan of that. And quite honestly, we would be doing that if we could. So we are, my husband and I, Greg, we're a blended family. This is our second marriage. We've been together for about nine or 10 years. And um, we cannot take our kids somewhere else because all of our, their other parents are in Atlanta. And so for us, we are locked into Atlanta for, I mean, for our own, like we, we made this choice ourselves, but we want to keep everyone here. Um, and so we cannot do that, but I'm a huge fan of that. And there's a lot of people who do it. And you better believe Greg and I talk a lot about where we're going and what we're doing when our kids go to college and post college. We want to be around when they're like home from college and stuff, but like we we have a lot a lot of plans and ideas um, of of more nomadic lifestyle post college. Great. Um, I'm going to blend two questions together because we are running a little short on time, and you can address them in which order you think because they kind of relate. So one of them, it, the first one is, what was the most important thing or decision? 
that you made that made you feel financially independent? And the second question is, how do you reconcile knowing you were doing the right things to grow and save money, but still they but still feel like you aren't saving enough? Hmm. Um, okay. What was the first question? Really quickly. I'm That's okay. To... I'm happy to. I'm trying that. to find it while you say that too. Um, so what was the most important thing or decision that you yeah. made? that made you feel financially independent. And they actually said, you know, maybe two or three things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, I'll do right? that one quick. Cause it's easier. And then I've got the okay. second one in front of me. Yep. Um, the second one's like a heavy question, but the first one, I, I would say maxing out my 401k and um, participating in my company's deferred compensation plan and, and maxing it out for a couple of years, which was 75% of my salary. So, okay. because that's, those are both tax deferred, the things that you can do, to lower your taxes, which are a really, really high, right? 25 to 40% for many people, depending on what they're making. And so what you can do to lower your taxes and be able to save, and it forces savings. And so when I def when, when you make that deferred compensation decision, at the way I, at many, many big companies have them, they're not well publicized at many companies, um, but it's a one year like lock-in. You can't change it. Like you can change your 401k amount throughout the year. When you lock it in at 75% for the year, you can't change it. So all of a sudden you've agreed to a significantly lower paycheck. And so the forced savings, so I'm a big fan of like automating your savings, but I, I sort of locked myself into the money being taken away from me and put into a, an account that I didn't have access to. And if I did want to access it, there'd be a huge financial penalty, which I'm too cheap to pay. So I'm not, I'm not going to too frugal to pay. And so um, I'd say those like maxing out my 401k, which again, five years of maxing out your four, I said, I didn't start maxing it out till I was 35. I would always take the company match and <clears throat> hit that amount, but I never really went beyond that significantly. Five years of maxing out over a hundred thousand dollars in your 401k that at, when you're four, you know, I was like a little under 40 then. So when I'm 40, I still have 25 years for that money to grow. That's a lot. I don't ever have to touch. I, I pre, just like we were talking about college, I pre-save for my kid's college. I pre-save for retirement. So I no longer need to max out my 401k because I have enough money in my 401k now for when I turn 65, whatever year I choose to take it. Um, and sorry, I'm saying 65 because I'm talking about social security too. But um, okay, another question. How do you reconcile knowing you are doing the right things to grow and save money, but still feel like you aren't saving or doing enough. That's a heavy question. That's very personal too, because it, it's sort of personalized to what you specifically are doing. Right. Um, and so, and, and enough is relative, right? I, I think it's, you want to do your best. You want to feel like you've, this all has to be tied to your goals, right? Like I I've started doing a small amount of financial coaching for people um, very small because I'm trying not to like actually I don't want a job right I want to hang out with my kids I want to be flexible and have freedom um, but I was having a conversation with someone and it kind of ties to this question of you know what you spend it depends on your goals right and so and how far you cut and how far you want to kind of suffer and, and and keep some level of intentional spending and values-based spending it just depends on what you want to do and so in some cases, you know, I have friends who are teachers and they just don't make a massive amount of money, which is unfortunate because teachers should make much more money than they do. Um, and they're only able to save so much, but they're also making decisions. They spend on things that I don't spend on, right? And so all of this is relative to your own personal decisions. And I'm, I know that's like kind of a half answer because that's a hard question uh, to answer specifically because it is so tied to, to each person individually. Um, but if that person wants to reach out, I, I think actually I'll throw that up now. My last slide is my contact information. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions. If, if any of you want to, um, you can text me at that number or you can um, leave a voicemail or you can uh, email and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Right. I'm, okay. I'm happy to do more here, but I was also just saying, I'm happy to answer individual questions if people want to reach out. Perfect. Thank you, Maggie. Um, we also put in the links to your podcast. And if you could stop share, I'm going to quickly share about what's coming next on uh, Business Over Breakfast. So just for those who are still with us, uh, next time we will be welcoming Catherine Mc McConnell back to the mic, if you will, to talk about gender distinctions and negotiations. Uh, then we'll have Brandon Smith rejoin Business Over Breakfast to talk about empowering your people 
leveraging the author editor concept. And then on October 5th, we're going to switch gears back to the generative AI. So humans use of AI assistance and the role of loss aversion, because I think a lot of people are feeling that loss aversion. Um, as always, we welcome you to check out our short courses on our website or reach out to my colleague, Tammy Long. We thank you again for joining us today. And Maggie, this has been incredibly insightful. You can tell by the, the interactions in the chat and the kudos and the thank yous. I encourage everyone to check out the resources that Maggie has available. I've had so much fun listening to both Friends on Fire and Inside Out Money. I don't intend to be a commercial, but it has really helped change my <laughs> mindset too. So Maggie, thanks again for sharing all these great insights with us this morning. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pam. I appreciate you guys having me and I hope everyone has an awesome day. Yep. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.